We are now recording. Uh, everyone, welcome to the uh, first annual Fantasy Cons uh, video panel on, and let me make sure I got the right one here because this isn't the only one I'm doing, uh, Characters, Conversations, and Dialogue. Now, what I have with me are two guests who I will introduce to you in just a second. Uh, beforehand, uh, I would like to say thank you for coming. Uh, we really appreciate your, your looking in here. And uh, my name is Guy Donovan. I'm the moderator of the panel. Uh, I've already agreed with the, uh, the two nice ladies with me here that I won't hog their time, but we got a slightly smaller panel than we had expected. So you might hear more from me than you either wanted or are willing to listen to. At any rate, uh, I am the author of the Dragon's Treasure trilogy, uh, two of which are out at the time of your seeing this. Uh, book one is Forgotten Princess Simona. Book two is A Cold White Home. Uh, Forgotten Princess Simone have been out about two years. Cold White Home will be releasing on October 28th. So as you are looking at this, it should be available on Amazon. That is the end of my plug. Uh, so we will move immediately on to uh, our first participant, Lisa Manifold. Hi, how are you guys? Thanks for doing this. Very welcome. And I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Lisa Manifold. I write fairy tale retelling fantasies. Uh, my series is called Sisters of the Curse. The first three books are out. The first one came out in May. It's called Thea's Tale. And then I wrote a novella called One Night at the Ball. And the second one is um, Casimir's Journey. And the third one will be out at the end of November. It's called Catherine's Grimoire. Fantastic. Uh, and we next move on to our second participant, Cat Styles. Hi there. Uh, my name is Cat Styles. I'm originally from Jersey, living in Texas. I wrote a book called Connected, and it's a YA paranormal romance uh, with superpowers and a serial killer and uh, lots of fun. That's me. Okay, great. All right. Uh, I, I forgot to mention uh, my own book that I won't beat you over the head with is Epic Fantasy. What about you, Lisa? What's your genre if I missed that? Um, it's fantasy. It's a fairy tale retelling. Oh, so that's I'm not right. quite where it fits in the genres. Okay, that's right. You did mention that. Okay, all right. Uh, as, as the moderator, I'm looking at a bunch of things here. So if I miss something, forgive me. Okay, that's fantastic. Uh, well, we will move on then. And uh, the, 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 the starting topic would be, and forgive me as I read off on this. Remember, I'm a, an amateur. Uh, as writers of fantasy, what lengths do you go to to get your dialogue right in terms of the time period? Now, uh, since we're dealing with slightly different genres, but all within the overall fantasy genre here, uh, I guess it depends on your time period. But uh, how do you guys feel about that? Where, where are you in terms of your time periods that you tend to write in? And if it's anything other than modern, how, you, how do you go about that? How do you, how do you deal with... Uh, dialogue that sounds appropriate to the period for a modern audience. The um, the series that I'm writing is based on a grim fairy tale, so I put it sort of middle ages. But I think that modern readers struggle a little bit if you use truly topical formal language. So I look for um, a blend so that it shows you it's a little more formal, but it's not entirely accurate. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, actually it does. It kind of fits in with what I do. Kat, what, mm -hmm. what's your thought? Yeah, I, my book is is more a paranormal, so it's modern times, but I know when I'm reading fantasy and I see thee and thou, it just completely <laughs> turns me off. So. <laughs> I understand that struggle with fantasy. Yeah, yeah. It, but it, I just yeah. have a little bit of Texas twang, and there's not really an issue with mine, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, being from one of the exits off of the Jersey Turnpike, I don't, uh, I don't hear much of a Texas twang coming from you. Uh, that no, was, that was my last <laughs> Jersey joke, cat. I promise. <laughs> uh, for my, I still say coffee, right? I can't oh, yeah. help it. <laughs> <laughs> you are from Deptford, are you? <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. Uh, I went to college in Philadelphia, by the way, so uh, so Jersey's uh, well known to me. Um, at any yes. rate, in in my own uh, in my own book, uh, it, it's written in fifth century Wales. So I deal with a lot of Welsh language. I deal with a lot of made up Pictish language because, of course, there's no uh, there's no written record of. Well, I shouldn't say written. There's no record of a spoken language of it. Uh, 
so I, I have to play in it to a certain extent with a little bit of those these and nows, though I avoid that. <laughs> it's just so cliche. Uh, now, some of my more noble characters, uh, they do in some instances need to speak with a more formal court speak. But more often than not, I try to limit that to just very small bits and then yes. go off into a sequence where it's just, that same person with another noble, and they can speak just like anyone else would speak to each other. Now, of course, that means it's still fifth century Britannia. Yeah. There's no y'alls, and uh, <laughs> there's, there's no like the the, the, the Rankin Bass Return of the King from the early 80s. Gandalf, Thanathor's flipped out. No, there's nobody <laughs> talking like that. Um, but yeah, I try to I try to uh, uh, skirt that balance, which is I think what Lisa was talking about. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I, I find it sort of hard because when I write, I tend to write very formally, but when it goes to my editor, my editor says, this would stop me in my tracks. So you have to, <laughs> you have to make it a little less formal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is what it's for, right? What the editor is for, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, well, then, uh, Kat, since you are the one of the three of us who's writing in a more modern, uh, more modern time period or perhaps I should say the modern time period. Uh, in terms of, of, of dialogue then, uh, I suppose a more appropriate question for you would be since, since nobody's going to be doing these and now is unless you're at an SCA uh, 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 meeting or something <laughs> along those lines, uh, or you want a character to really be intentionally annoying, uh, then how do you go about using dialogue in the modern world in order to try to set your characters apart so that they have that, that voice? that's instantly recognizable. Uh, you know, what's really, what's really funny, because I, I write at YA, and somebody gave me the advice to go and listen to teenagers speak in a natural setting like a Starbucks or something, and I swear I've heard the word like 4,000 times. And you can't do that either. So <laughs> there's, there's, there's something to say that it can't be like what teenagers really speak. It, it just can't because you would you would read it and, and you would just scratch your head. So I think with my characters, it was more of the way their families raised them. So the, the mother of the main character is, is a little more standoffish and the love interest has a very warm family style. So it, it, was, more, it was more along those lines and, and how they interact with each other. I didn't, like I said, I, I didn't really put a whole lot of y'alls or anything like that, <laughs> but I tried to get it where it kind of made sense in the, in the settings too, so. Okay, uh, well, where geographically is it set? Central Texas. Oh, okay, okay, I gotcha. I, I make up the town names, but it's, it's really between uh, San Marcos kind of area. Um, Manchez in the book is really uh, Manchek, uh, that's an actual place, but I mean, that I, I kind of took my inspiration from areas around me, but Cannondale isn't a real city as far as I know. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I, it, it's such a small place. Uh, I, 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 I can't say as I know all of the little uh, towns in that little itty bitty place called Texas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you don't want to, you don't want to take off all like 1500 people who live in Odessa. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Odessa's been done. That's that's heroes. Oh you know, uh, yeah, heroes that's right. And loving you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay. All right. Um, and Lisa, back to you then, um, because you're doing fairy tales. I assume that's in sort of a non-specific time period, though clearly it old world. It is very old world. I make up a lot of place names for my countries, mm -hmm. but it's based on a Central European yeah. um, sort of world. Mm -hmm. You know, I mix a little bit of my, my fantasy world with what we know about the Middle Ages. So there's a little bit of a frame of reference to be going on. Well, and the Middle Ages also encompasses about a thousand years of human history. Yes. <laughs> Technically, in 5th century, I'm dealing with the early Middle Ages, because Roman, or the uh, Romans. coming out of the Dark Ages, though, with the 5th well, century. Well, exactly. It's it's that borderline between antiquity and into the early Middle Ages, the early medieval period. Um, but uh, yeah, the the historical records are so 
scattered and uh, and in disagreement with each yes. other, depending on who you're talking to, whether it's Livy or whoever, whatever historian you want to, ancient historian who is basically telling the, the history based on who won. Uh, yeah. It can be difficult. Now, do you make sort of an amalgam of, uh, of, of these things? This is going to sound sort of silly, but when I write, I tend to write without a lot of contractions. And so I will go back. I know it's, it sounds awful. No, and then not you go at all. Back loud and you think oh my goodness so I go back and I will add contractions in so that it's not entirely casual but it's not really formal either so mm -hmm. that people who are reading it today don't go through and get stuck on my god why do they use ten words when five will do <laughs> okay well that was somewhere I was gonna go in a few minutes but we can just go ahead and dive into that right now the use of contractions uh, I tend to avoid them in my narrative However, in my author's narrative, as the as the mm -hmm. narrator of this story, I do not use uh, other than repetition of had had. I'd go with mm -hmm. had had instead of I had had that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. However, in my characters, whether or not they used contractions in the in the time period, I use contractions, not completely. I think, I think it makes more sense for the audience that's reading it. Because mm -hmm. we don't we don't think in I am so glad to see you. How have you been today? I'm glad to see you. How have you been? Exactly. Um, so you want your reader to just flow smoothly through your dialogue exactly. without getting into it. Mm -hmm. And you, Kat? Oh, I I, I contract everything. I, I you know when I see <laughs> when I see it not contracted when I'm reading something again that's one of those things that just kind of ticks me off. But I get it for period pieces. It makes sense sometimes. But I still read it, and I'm like, <laughs> so I use contractions like almost completely. I only when I'm making emphasis, like I yeah. am not here. Yeah. That's the only time yeah. I don't use it. <laughs> okay, so so you don't draw the distinction between your your author's narrative and the characters that are speaking. You just contract all over the place. Yes, because she's a teenager. Mm -hmm. she, would, sure. she would use the action. She would use that kind of language. Okay. Well, let me ask you this then. Uh, this is something uh, that I'm not familiar uh, with your work. Do you tell it from a first person? I did this. I did that. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Can there you go. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that makes that makes total sense. And and you know, having said that, it would make total sense if you did it either way. Because honestly, there's no right way to write this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. It's all personal style. It's all what people like or don't like. Uh, so, but no, that totally makes sense if you're doing the first person thing. Uh, have you? Are you? I I don't recall from your introduction. Have you written anything else or just the one? Just the one for now. I'm working on the sequel. So okay, which I imagine will also be first person. I just didn't know if you were considering doing a, a tr uh, trying to go into a different POV on another work. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> That's probably my worst pet peeve is multiple POV. Now I say this and I'm in a fantasy panel, so please don't hate me. <laughs> the multiple POV is very, very done right. You know, just pick a person and do third person. Don't jump around in characters' heads, but I, I get that sometimes it's necessary. Mm -hmm. But for me it just it just confuses me as a reader. I, I do a lot of reading. So I've been reading a lot of fantasy lately and I've been seeing that and just but yeah, don't. It, between books is one thing, but within like the chapter, well, you know, it, it just frustrates me. So. Well, and that was what I was referring to: is if you're going to write another book, if if you would do it in a different POV than the first person. I don't think so because mm -hmm. the readers have bonded with her in this first book, and mm -hmm. I think changing it to third person or, or something like that it would it would lose some of its effectiveness. Okay, so it's definitely a series. Yes, yes, oh, okay. at least three that I've got planned out so far, but okay. we'll see. Right. Well, I may just milk it for a fourth like everyone else does these days. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's Hollywood's territory. They do that with the movie, <laughs> not the writer. <laughs> Don't do four. Don't yeah. do the fourth one. Leave it at three. <laughs> okay, uh, well, let me take a quick look here because I believe I had a follow-up. Uh, well, uh, actually, my follow-up is pretty much already covered about whether your time period is completely made up or modern or anything else. Um, but uh, let me go on to this uh, concept then. Um, in terms of dealing with characters' inner thoughts, 
Now, Kat, you're you're doing a first person, so you're going to have to deal with in internal monologue, uh, or perhaps I should say internal dialogue. Uh, how do you go about doing that? Uh, do you how do you separate that? Other than use of quotes or not use of quotes, how do you separate that from her spoken dialogue? Well. I, and, and and that was that was a really that was the thing I really struggled with because I like to do it in italics. Italics make sense. It says, okay, this is a thought, yep. but then she thinks a lot in the book, <laughs> <laughs> so it's got italics all over the place, and now it, it doesn't read right. So, uh, some some of the more pivotal thoughts, I guess, are italicized. The you know fleeting thoughts about something insignificant, maybe not so. Um, every once in a while I would put the I thought tag, but not very often. It was just one of those things where most of the time it was italicized, but if the italics got too crazy, then it wasn't. You were in her head anyway, so you kind of knew, right? Okay, all right. And, uh, and Lisa, back to you. I'm, pretty, I'm somewhat similar to Kat. Uh, my books are all written in third person because even though it's a series, uh, the main character of each book changes. It's all the same characters, but each character has their own book. And uh, I do it, since I do it in third person, I didn't want to do tons of italics because they are in their own heads. So if it's a direct thought in response to something else that's going on, it's in italics. If they're just sort of musing, it's not in italics. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, for my own, uh, I am dealing with not only a, a large cast, and uh, Kat, you're going to hate me for this, but multiple POVs. <laughs> <laughs> large cast over three very large books. Uh, somewhere along the way, i got to get into other people's heads and why they're doing things. Um, but, and, and it's also scattered all up and down the entire island of, uh, of Great Britain. Uh, so anyway, uh, it also involves a telepathic angle. Now, uh, I have to go through whole conversations that are done telepathically. And that is, as, as you said, the easiest kind of italics to set everything aside. But I still find myself having to frequently go through the he said, she said, he thought, mm -hmm. she thought, uh, for the simple fact that, you know, well, it's a, it's a conversation. Uh, I'm not Cormac McCarthy. I have to have dialogue tags. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever read Road or anything else in Cormac McCarthy's, but I, I, I and uh, people are going to want to light me on fire for saying this, but I honestly don't see the big brouhaha over the guy. I tried reading Road, and there's a conversation between the man and the boy, and those are the only names they have in the book. And it goes on for about five pages, and there's never a single dialogue tag <laughs> such as the man said or the boy said or the boy replied nothing mm -hmm. so about three pages into it I got so totally lost I had to backtrack and do it all over again yeah. now that's not entirely in line with our topic here but that leads us into dialogue tags what do you guys think about use of those sparingly or fairly often I try to go sparingly mm -hmm. I read a lot of my work out loud and when you're reading it and it's he said, she said, he chuckled, mm -hmm. he giggled, or you know what, that gets tiresome to read, <laughs> I think. Mm -hmm. So I try to say, I try to indicate who it is by what they're doing, you know, or there, there's something that they're doing so that you know who it is that is speaking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I do that a lot too. So I'll just start talking and then she'll do something with her hands, and then she'll finish her sentence. So you know who she is. Right? <laughs> um, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, I, I barely use them at all uh, because you, you know who's talking, right? If there's three, because there were three main characters in my book, that I would have to do more tags, but I would mostly stick to, to said because the colorful tags are just a distraction, you know, like chuckles and all of those different exciting ways to say said mm -hmm. when you don't need to do that, right? You can just say something else. And so I try not to get too many of the colorful texts, mostly said when I have to do it. And, and I try to avoid the adverbs too. <laughs> we all that's know hard. Adverbs, you know? I'm sorry. I said, that's hard because you get going on your, you're in your groove and you keep writing and then you look back and you see all the L Y's. Yes. Yes. <laughs> 
he chuckled menacingly, and you're thinking, oh, my God, where did they all come from? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I, 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 I won't. I write with adverbs naturally, so I have to, I have to edit that. That's one of those things, you know? Well, uh, in my uh, in my previous panel, which was on writing a better fight scene, uh, the 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 name it's unavoidable. The name uh, uh, Robert E. Howard came up. How can you not? It's Conan. Talk about your quintessential mm -hmm. fight scenes. Well, one of my comments about Robert Howard was there is no way in God's green earth that guy would get published nowadays. Uh, no. I, have, I just <laughs> yeah. reread one of his stories, and holy cow, one paragraph would have like eight or ten adverbs. And really? Yeah, it oh just God. it gets a little old. He jumped quickly and then <laughs> and then leaps smartly before he's snidely remarked. <laughs> and there and it's it's great pulpy stuff, and it's it's one of those deals where it's it's kind of got a patina of classicness about it because of its age i think and the and the influence it had but yeah you just can't do that stuff anymore the modern audience is going to roll their eyeballs and put the book away so why did you even bother to write it right <laughs> i think you have to go that's one thing that i'm learning i tend to like i said i tend to write with 10 words when five will do but you have to do it so that your audience has no reason to put down the book because if your conversation you know gets a little bogged down or you're internal monologue lags or whatever if it lags they're like yeah okay and it's gone they're done and they don't <laughs> come back <laughs> yet there are still those classics that we go back to time and time again that by today's standards are completely overwritten now uh, again uh, cardinal rule of, of fantasy panels uh, the name J.R.R. Tolkien must contractually be mentioned at least <laughs> one. and talk about a series that is beloved by millions I love it. I love it. Really? I love this. It is a real, that is a, a series where, oh God, no pitchforks, where there's like 20 <laughs> words for five, but you read them and you just love the words so much that I think your normal standard of, oh God, I can't believe we're using 20 words instead of five. People put that aside because of how wonderful the book is. Exactly. The, uh, the criticism of, uh, of The Lord of the Rings in specific uh, is that it is so overwritten. Uh, and the same could be leveled at uh, anything of Charles Dickens, for crying out loud, A Tale of Two Cities. I believe it's chapter five. Starts what is it out by like the word, though? It's a five-page uh, dissertation on a doorknob and what it looked like <laughs> before the last sentences, and then the doorknob turned and the Marquis de Sade entered the room. Oh, my God, did I need to sit through all that? <laughs> but yet, these are the classics that we go back to all the time. Victor Hugo, Les Miserables, is something like 1,300 pages long. And one of Jane my Austen. favorite books. Exactly, Jane Austen. All of I mean, those she's not fancy, but uh, I did a book club with... And her book was a, the book of our month. And one of the people complained that there was a sentence with 147 words. <laughs> and, <laughs> lot of commas. and one verb. <laughs> well, yeah, one verb, 147 words. <laughs> yeah, I think I read something like that in Pride and Prejudice. Somebody told me I had to read that book. And I just, I know people are going to hate me, but I'm not an Austin fan at all. I don't get it. <laughs> I, I mean, I kind of understand the characterization part of it. That's cool. And the whole feminist angle, I'm with that. But it was just too much. It was just, it was so. Oh. And I you think know, it was the a little bit of a fantasy. But her dialogue is so wonderful. I mean, if you can get past the 14 commas, her dialogue is so wonderful <laughs> for conveying so much with very mild language. I, mm. I'm a Jane Austen fan, yeah. but I don't hold it against you, Kat. Um, <laughs> her, she's got, she's, she's the, uh, to me, she's one of the queens of saying something one way and it means something entirely different. And I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, well, Sorry, uh, segue there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's, that's fine. We, we've segued quite a bit, but uh, I, I personally, when I run these panels, I don't like to over overstructure them too much. I like to be able to just get us into a conversation and and see where it goes. Uh, and and I think that's that's uh, I think that's happening here. Now, Cat, uh, let's go back to you really quick because uh, this is about conversation and dialogue. Uh, what do you do? 
in your in your in your dialogue that you think sets you apart from anybody else? And I love your cat, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of three. Sorry, he he wanted to be part of this. I guess. Um, I guess what I do with my dialogue is I I really tend to advance the plot with my dialogue. Um, I make sure that everything that they're saying is about the plot and it's moving forward. Um, there, I've, so it's a romance, right? So there are a lot of romance scenes and the romance developing and all that, but I, I do a lot less with, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs about what's going on. And I do more of the kids are talking about it and that's how they're figuring out what's going on and, and solving the mystery. Uh, Lisa? Mine is similar to, uh, to Kat's. It's not a romance per se, but the plot moves forward. Uh, my characters are centered around a court. So as ladies in the court, they didn't do a whole lot. I mean, th that's one thing that I found when I was doing a lot of research. To th I mean, they sewed and they visited and they got, but they didn't do a lot. So you have to lose, use dialogue. They gossiped a lot. Um, so you use dialogue <laughs> to move forward because gossip was the big thing that they did you know they would embroider and gossip like crazy so while there's not a lot of action the characters do a lot of sharing which it may not be entirely appropriate as far as that time frame for so much sharing but they don't do anything so they have to move forward somehow mm -hmm. yes they do well i'm sure they had plenty of cats there too didn't they <laughs> you know, I didn't introduce a lot of pets into into it. Mm -hmm. I I did not start out to myself, uh, and I I did wind up a little bit, but uh, it was one thing that I kind of let go a little bit uh, was in the royal court there would have been animals. I I, I did have an, a, a a specific reason for why there were no dogs because of course dogs were used for hunting back then. Uh, as they are now, of course, but uh, but I got so wrapped up in my plot and my dialogue and all the humans doing things that animals really took kind of a a, a, a back seat, which is not the point of this panel anyway. But uh, <laughs> the obvious distraction kind of walked across the bottom of the screen. I couldn't resist a little poke there. Okay, all right. Sorry about that. I'm going to put one no, in the second. No, that's book. fine. That's fine. Gives us all something to look at. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to turn it over to the two uh, to the two of you for a little bit. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say? We'll we'll go right back to Cat for a few minutes, and then back to Lisa. Cat, start us off. Uh, is there something you would like to say? Uh, something that's on your mind about dialogue and how to how to handle it, or maybe examples of really bad dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure I could look in my first draft and give you a lot of examples of bad dialogue, mostly. Um, lack of tr contractions, right? Or, or the other thing that annoys me about um, dialogue is where it's like the 147 uh, words, right? Because <laughs> people don't talk like that. People have very short sentences, right? So I, that's in my editing, I had to do that. I had to, I, and one of the biggest things that I always tell everyone else with uh, writing is read it out loud. And if yes. it doesn't sound like something you would say or your character would say, then make it sound more natural. Because writing, I mean, we tend to go in our heads and we paint everything and we we got the verbose mode on, right? I'm sorry, I'm in IT. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we just kind of go with it. And then we end up with something that is not natural. It's not what anyone would say to each other. So, I mean, that's kind of what I do. Okay. Lisa? Uh, I'm similar to Kat. I, have, I go to two different critique groups, and when I'm struggling with something where I just can't get it right, I bring it and read it to the critique groups, and they will say right away, that does not sound right. It sounds really stilted, or, you know, you've got you've to use five words because you're using ten. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask Kat, because she writes in Young Adult, do you find, Kat, that you do first-person um, primarily or... Are you also looking at like first person and third person? Because I'm going to be doing um, paranormal romance, and I find a lot of them go first person, 
for the female main character, and then the male is usually third person. So you're changing your voice up a little bit with that. Yes, and well, my original draft of Connected was third person. Mm -hmm. And it was, I don't know if it was multiple point of view, it kind of was like every chapter was about one of the characters, but I discovered that the story was really Ems, it was the, the main character, the one girl, everyone else around her kind of fell in. So it's, it's one of those things that has to do more with your plot and who, whose story it really is, um, I think, when you're trying to decide you know, which POV to do. Um, I could see third person easily with most of it going on in the main character's head as well, um, as opposed to multiple POV. <laughs> Again, fantasy, I get it, but with romance yeah, I like especially. Multiple, I like multiple point of view. I like knowing <laughs> what more than one character is thinking. Yeah, but it, so it's a lot harder to write first person or even third person where you're only seeing the thoughts of that one person because all of the rest of that stuff, the person, the character has to figure out. Um, I kind of got around some of that by making her an empath, which is wonderful because now I know what everyone's feeling. Right? <laughs> so superpowers are a great beat to that whole thing. Um, but it, it is a lot harder to write it that way because because you have to figure, the character has to figure out all of these things, either through dialogue or through spying on the other person or <laughs> getting information from somebody else. You know, I mean, how do you find out what's going on inside somebody else's head? So, um, oh, I kind of like that too. I'm all right with the reader knowing more than the, the characters do. You know, and towards the end, the character starts to figure it out. But I, I think that's what I like about it when you said that it made me think about this. I think that's what I like about multiple point of view is that you, as the reader, are a little more ahead of where the characters are, and I like seeing how the characters come up to speed with what you as the reader know. Yeah, and, and that, that is kind of a cool aspect of it. I mean, I think, like I've seen the, the major writers in my genre, like uh, Stephanie Meyer, she actually released some chapters through Edward's point of view for um, Twilight. I love so, I read the Midnight Sun. I love those chapters. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's cool, and, and it's really kind of a neat exploration, definitely, for, for the fans. So, I mean, I, I do get it, and I think it would be fun. I just wish, you know, I didn't feel like if I did that, it would, it would kill me, and, and the users would not be happy. So, I'm, I'm afraid of that. <laughs> I'm afraid of all the POV. <laughs> Well, I have to say, Kat, uh, some of the some of the novels I have read that have been uh, first person, uh, 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 limited perspective like that have been fantastic, and I can't imagine them any other way. Along the lines of uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter series, Tarzan, uh, th that kind of work. Uh, it's it's not for me. I'm not a first person uh, kind of writer. That's just that's just uh, the fact of it. But uh, it takes all kinds, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I found uh, the first person uh, a, a point of view in, I hope Lisa is still with us. She seems to be frozen in time and space. You okay, Lisa? We'll get back to Lisa in just a minute. We're running out of time anyway. Uh, I, I found, say, uh, particularly in, in The Hunger Games, I found the, I found the, the, uh, the, the concept was better than the actual writing. And I can't fault Suzanne Collins. The woman has made uh, a, a bajillion dollars off of this. And we just lost Lisa. Uh, okay, well, we'll finish it up. You and I, Kat. We got about four minutes <laughs> left. Um, now, I love The Hunger Games. Don't get me wrong. And I actually, uh, though, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to utter the sacrilege of saying that I think that the movies have been better than the books. Uh, but wow. that, that first yeah. person, for me, felt like it limited the scope of the story. Uh, whereas uh, in John Carter of Mars, it did not, because it was all about John Carter. But, but the world of Hunger Games is a little bigger than that. Uh, we might be getting Lisa back here. 
at any rate, uh, can you think of any particular uh, 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 other POVs that you've enjoyed, even though you don't particularly feel the need to write them? Oh, yes. So okay. I, get, I get why you have to do that. I mean, there are some stories that you really need to, to see. You need to be with the other characters, right? You need to see what's going on beyond what the first person can do. Mm -hmm. um, that it is very limiting. But for me, it, I, it, made my, it made my book stronger because this was a love story and you were supposed to root for this one person, you were supposed to bond with her. And first person, while it does limit what you can see, what else is going on, mm -hmm. it does bring the reader a little bit closer. Um, yes. But oh, some of my, actually, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I, I'm just agreeing with you. Absolutely. It's uh, your, yeah. your character is then the sole limelight. Right. But at, one of my favorite books of all time was in third person, but it felt like it was in first person. So I, I really, I will read everything. Which is? Um, it's actually by an indie author called Wendy Wilson. Okay. It, it's called... Uh, oh, Not the lead singer of the Plasmatics. <laughs> Shadow strength. I'm sorry. That's what it's okay. called, and it's it's absolutely wonderful. I what I do on my blog is I try to find um, indie authors and and promote their books when I when I like them, and I Abs try to do that absolutely. because there's not there's there's too many websites and everything that is about the big five published books and oh absolutely nobody gets these wonderful indie books so. I'm going to have to cut you off there, yeah. uh, Kat. Uh, Lisa, we lost you for a little bit. Welcome back. Yes. Uh, I'm going to give you Thank a few you. seconds here to, uh, to give us a last, uh, a last thought from you before I wrap it up. Um, I'm actually uh, sort of inspired what Kat said. I'm a big believer in the indie authors as well. So it's awesome to see so many authors moving forward past, you know, the traditional uh, stigma of being an indie author. Absolutely. You know, and working more on what works, like panels like this, what works for dialogue, you know, and how to smooth things out so that the readers not only read your book and don't put it down, but they love it. Okay. All right. Great. All right. I'm going to let that be the last word. We have exactly one minute left. So I'm going to take that minute to basically thank everybody out there uh, for coming onto YouTube or linking through the fantasy <coughs> Check this panel out, uh, and I, I want to thank again my two guests, Lisa Manifold and Kat Stiles, for being so kind as to come on and share their thoughts. And uh, these panels will go up uh, in, uh, in their day, and I will try to let you guys know ahead of time when they do. So thank you okay, all. Okay, great. And thank you so much. You're very welcome. And everybody out there, in the last few seconds, look these two ladies up. Buy their books. Read them. I'm sure they're fantastic. Want to look at mine too. Thank you. Yay. All right. Thanks. Have a bye good day. Bye. <laughs> bye.